Hello, this is Pastor Bella, Alex Nosagi. Good evening, God girls, and welcome to part eight of the Husbands of the Bible series. Yes, praise the Lord. Tonight, we are looking at Adam, the very first man created, the very first husband. And we have important things to learn from Adam. All right, so let's go into the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us, I'm reading from the Amplified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beasts, and over all of the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image and likeness of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. The creation of man was so important that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had to unite to create man in their own image. It is so powerful looking at this scripture because the unity of God is seen in this scripture. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came together to create this being. And male and female, he created them. Male and female were created on the same day, but formed on different days. I have taken the time to teach on Back to Eden. It's a four-part series available on YouTube. Take time and listen to it. I mean, what happened in Eden is so, so deep. So deep. So incredibly deep. And to God be all the glory for his divine revelation. But we have to focus on Adam tonight. He was the very first man created. He was the very first husband. But something went wrong. Again, we are looking at the various husbands of the Bibles for you to understand that there are different kinds of men. And the scripture that we keep going back to is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. So God is letting us know in that scripture that there are different kinds of husbands. There are different kinds of husbands, different personality types, different ways that they would make mistakes. How do you submit in that regard? So we're going back to Adam the very first man created, and God was creating a world, a people that he expected to love and worship him and relate with him. But something went wrong in Eden. And that's why when you go all the way down to the book of Revelation, you see that the end of the world is going back to fix what went wrong in the beginning of the world. Halfway through, Christ came and died for the whole world. Christ came as the second Adam because the first Adam fell in disobedience to God. Okay? So I just wanted to show you how important it was as man came into being where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had to unite and create this being. This incredibly special being. Okay? So, God spoke it forth. That's how he created things. He spoke things forth. But now, in Genesis chapter 2, you begin to see how Adam was formed. 
chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life, and man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, framed, constituted. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight or to be desired good, suitable, pleasant for food. The tree of life also in the center of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. It was there. It was all in the garden of Eden. And God gave Adam a responsibility. God gave him a job to do. Take care of this environment. Because when you read, go back to chapter 1, after they were male and female, God created them. God then goes on to give the authority, the dominion to them on how he was creating them as the higher beings on earth to rule, to dominate, to subdue, to plant, to grow. He was giving them authority. Okay, so now Adam is in the Garden of Eden and God gives him the garden to tend. And what a beautiful, a beautiful job description, you know, because Eden was so beautiful. That was perfection in itself. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and guard and keep it. The garden of Eden to tend and guard and keep it. That's where things starts off with a man. He is called to tend, to guard and keep all that God has entrusted to him. The work of his hands and the family Marriage is a garden. Your husband must tend, guard, and keep you. You are his greatest treasure. You and the children that you bring into the family. Your husband must protect you. He must tend you. That's nurture you, love you. He must guard you, protect you. He must keep you. He must love you. He must cherish you. He must treasure you. It all started in Eden. Verse 16, God gives the instruction and the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and blessed and calamity, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God had an explicit instruction for Adam. An explicit instruction. I've given you everything. But this tree, you better stay away from it. So in Adam, we begin to see the inherent nature of man. The inherent nature of man is to rebel. You don't like boundaries? You just want to rebel. Alright? So God has designated. You can have everything else but this. But this, and after God says that, verse 18, now the Lord God said it is not good, sufficient, satisfactory that man should be alone. I will make him a helper meet, suitable, adapted, complementary for him. I know someone was asking what a help meet means. That's why I like the amplified. I will make him a helper meet, suitable, adapted, complementary for him. A helper that's suitable comparable, complementary for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every wild beast and living creature of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. Adam had a great job to do. He had a great job. He had so much power and authority. And Adam gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the air and to every wild beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper meet, suitable, adapted, complementary for him. All that was available, they were animals. They were animals. There was not a companion there that was suitable for Adam. So God had to bring forth woman.
He, woman was deliberately created by God to be a companion, suitable, complementary, a helper for Adam. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs or a part of his side and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib or part of his side, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he built up and made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. Oh, I can teach about marriage right here. <laughs> Praise God. God is awesome. God is awesome. So you see, again, in verse 1, male and female were created on the same day, but formed on different days. At the beginning of chapter 2, Adam is formed. Then, towards the end of chapter 2, God puts Adam in a deep sleep and brings Eve out of him. A deep sleep. A deep sleep. Huh. Let me quickly go into marriage. You know, you know I love talking about marriage. All right. Remember in my teaching titled The Waiting Room, again available on YouTube. I've told you that when it comes to marriage, you're in a waiting room. And in that waiting room, it's not like in the waiting room of the hospital where there's a whole bunch of sick people waiting to be seen by the doctor. God's waiting room is for you to get active, actively, purposefully pursuing the work of God. Okay? Because marriage then comes to meet you right there in your purpose. It's not something that you go searching, looking for. Look at when Adam's wife was created. He was put in a deep sleep. He was in a deep sleep when Eve was created. He didn't, he didn't know any better. He didn't go to God and say, God, I need a companion. Adam was okay as he was. He didn't know any better. But God... Being merciful and generous and gracious, he looked at Adam and said, I can do something more for Adam. He needs a companion. So single God girls, single people, you think God is not looking at you? He's giving you a purpose. Some of you are working in your purpose, working actively for God, loving God, pursuing God. And you thinking God has forgotten you when it comes to marriage? It's just going to take a moment and he will connect you to who he has ordained for you. Adam, all Adam had to do was go to sleep. And the Lord made it a deep sleep because the first surgery in the Bible is performed here. But what a magnificent surgery. The surgery that we perform today is to fix stuff that has gone wrong. But the surgery of God <laughs> adds to you. Takes you to a higher level. The surgery of God was not fixing what was wrong with Adam internally. He was manifesting through Adam. It was manifesting a deliberate, beautiful creation called woman. Look at Adam in verse 23. Then Adam said, this creature is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. That's Adam in that moment rising to his priestly and prophetic authority. Which is what a godly husband should be to you. He should look at you and pronounce the blessings of God over your life, over your children. He should pray over you and speak with authority. He should know what you carry. He should support what you carry. Do you understand what I'm saying? Adam looked at his wife and he knew what she was. She was born of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He then named her. He gave her an identity in that moment. Remember, I've taught you all about the God-girl initiative that our identity lies in Christ. Your identity does not lie in any man. But a godly husband should know the woman that God has given to him. The purpose that that woman is carrying. He may not fully know it, but he must be fully supportive of it. So in that moment, you see the priestly prophetic authority coming out of Adam, confidently naming this woman. All right, And you see the path that God took him through. He had confidently named the animals, the birds, and everything. So now he knew what to do when he saw this magnificent creature. There was, there was no other animal like this woman. This was, she was like, wow. Yeah, that's my woman. So he claimed her immediately. Your husband, when he sees you, he will claim you. He will know that you're the one he's to marry. 
When you run into a man who's he's not sure, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, 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 uh. you better keep your cool because your husband to be will be sure. It doesn't take a man too long to know that there is something different about this woman, and this is the woman I want to marry. It doesn't take a man too long to figure it out. So if he's still trying to figure it out, then okay, all the best to him. You keep serving God in your purpose. Stay in the place of prayer. All right? Pray against any delay or tactics of the enemy. Men are very decisive when it comes to marriage. So when you run into a man who's not decisive or uh, he's kind of scared to commit and things like that, those are delayed tactics of the enemy. So you just stay in a place of prayer and you just pray generally. You say, Father, if this is the one that you have for me, every delay, every obstacle, take it out of the way and perfect it. But never ever pursue a man. You're not supposed to. He should see you and know who you are to him. He should know. He knows you are his woman. He knows. He knows. And then God performs the first marriage. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So God is establishing what marriage should be. I mean, Adam and Eve had no father or mother other than God, right? But God is establishing in this moment what marriage is supposed to be because God is speaking into the future. Adam and Eve are going to have children, right? Okay, so when we're going to get married, God is speaking to the men that the man needs to leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one. And it is in sex that that oneness continues. Remember, created on the same day but formed on different days. Now they're two individuals. Eve was within Adam from the very first moment. But she had to be brought out and physically manifest because she had a different purpose. She was created as a helper to Adam. But she also had her own purpose of creation. Praise God. A woman is the one that is supposed to be pregnant. A man can't birth no babies by himself. So women, we are powerful. I say we are powerful. We populate the earth. We do. We are powerful. We should never lose sight of that. You bring something great and distinct and magnificent to the table. Don't ever look at yourself as something that's not of worth. You're incredible. You are incredible. You are spectacular. You are magnificent. You have a great destiny. Don't let anyone look down on you and don't look down on yourself. You were created deliberately, deliberately by God. Like Eve was created deliberately by God. She was manifested deliberately by God. Hallelujah. She was manifested deliberately by God. Adam needed a companion. And God saw it. So you think God sees you in your single season and he, he, he doesn't know what you need? But when you stay in the place of purpose, you tend what the Lord has placed in your hand. And you focus on the Lord like Adam was focused on the Lord. He didn't know there was anything wrong with him. He was just living. And then boom, God gives him the gift of life. Your marriage is the most important. Hmm. Marriage is the most important gift of God over your life if you have been ordained to marry is the most important gift of God over your life because it's going to enhance you it's going to multiply you it's going to take your destiny to a deeper level a greater glory that's why you cannot afford to make a mistake when it comes to marriage you have to wait on God to speak clearly on whoever Whichever man is approaching you. Or for the men listening to this message, whichever woman you are inclined to make your wife. You have to pray. And say, Lord, is this it? Because their destiny is tied to your marriage. Your destiny is tied to it. Her destiny is tied to it. His destiny is tied to it. <laughs> I always have to remind myself to talk to the men too. Because this is going to be on YouTube versus here on WhatsApp. I'm just talking to the women. Praise God. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not 
embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. They were naked and unashamed, frolicking in the Garden of Eden, having all the sex that they want to have, Compan companionship. You see, marriage is beyond just sex. It's companionship. you just being in that company of that person and just enjoying each other. There's no catch. You don't have to be having sex all the time, but someone to talk to who gets you, who encourages you, who just loves you, who enjoys your company, nothing attached. It's just you and him enjoying each other. So that's what they were doing, enjoying each other. But here comes the serpent. And let me tell you something about the serpent. He's still alive and well today. He came after Adam and Eve. So you don't think that you're going to get married and the serpent is not coming after you. Oh, he's coming. That's why you got to be prepared for the attack of the enemy. The devil doesn't want you to be happy. The devil doesn't want you, you to keep your blessings. So here comes the slimy, evil serpent. And remember, God had given them dominion over every creature. Over every creature. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 and 29 and 30. God gave them dominion so they could have rebuked this serpent. But something went off here. Now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, can it really be that God has said you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? He went through the woman because he knew one reason he went through the woman, he knew the woman was Adam's weakness. Remember when your husband loves you. Remember we looked at Abraham last time. Sarah was Abraham's weakness, the love he had for her. That's why some people say, oh, love makes people weak. Love makes you vulnerable. Love can make you take decisions that are outside of God. How many of us have compromised because of love? How many of us end up in fornication because we loved him? So love can lead you to make fleshy decisions, can lead you to compromise. So the serpent was crafty. He didn't go to Adam directly. He went through Eve because he knew that Eve was irresistible and Adam was in love with her. So let me go and talk to her first of all. Well, the serpent did. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden, except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And Eve is already preaching and a weird message there because God didn't say anything about touching it. You know, he just said, don't eat of it. So Eve is adding to the message. So at some point, Adam had given Eve the instruction because when God told that to Adam, Eve was still within Adam. She hadn't been formed yet. Remember, when you go back to chapter 2, when God gives Adam that instruction, in verse 17, Eve wasn't physically manifested. So at some point when she was physically manifested and they were frolicking in the Garden of Eden, walking around, and he was showing her around. You know how men are. Let me show you. Let me show you what we have, babe. Let me show you. This is where we live, right? And that's that animal, and that's that tree, and that's, you know, that's typical, right? And so Adam must have passed across God's commandment to Eve. So that's why she's responding to the serpent. But for whatever reason, she did not assimilate it well because she's going further than don't eat it. She's saying, neither should you touch it. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. That's how the devil gets you. The devil gets you with your desire. Of course, it's very, it's a powerful, heady thing. Now, hmm, oh, eyes will be open, and we will be like God? Ooh, that sounds cool. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit. How did she see that the tree was good for food? She listened to the serpent. Do not listen to the serpent in your marriage. Do not listen to the voice of the flesh. The flesh speaks. It speaks fleshy desires. I spent time on the phone today talking to a young man talking to him about the desires of the flesh you need to know how to subdue your desires you need to but this is what is strange here she also 
gave to her husband with her and he ate. Adam was right next to this woman while the serpent was discussing with her. Adam was right next to her. Adam did not at any point in time intercede and say, Serpent, I rebuke you. I have dominion over you in the name of Jesus. Of course, he hasn't physically met the Jesus I'm talking about, right? But he had a relationship with God the Father. He had been given dominion over all the animals. He knew what this animal was. He may not have known it was the devil, but he knew this was the serpent, which he named a serpent, and he has authority over the serpent. But he was just looking there like a dum-dum. And what does that tell me? Adam, too, had a curious desire to know what it's like to be like God. So we should not just blame Mama Eve. Papa Adam was also curious. It was the desire of the flesh for his eyes to be open and understand what God had been keeping from him. But what I want to show you in this moment is the danger of having a husband that is spiritually weak. Because if Adam was spiritually strong... He would have shut this thing down from the beginning. He would have not taken that fruit from his wife to eat. He would have smacked that fruit out of her hand. He would have risen up to protect her. Because your spouse is supposed to rise up and protect you where you are weak. That's the beauty of marriage. You'll find out that your spouse's strength may be your weakness. And your strength will be your spouse's weakness. Complimentary. You're a helpmate. Complimentary. Suitable to him. You lift him up where he's weak. But here the two of them are weak. This is the danger of spiritual regression. This is the danger of not staying in a place of prayer and preparing for temptation. Because the devil's coming. I'm telling you. He came for Adam and Eve. He's coming for you. He's coming for your husband. He's coming for your wife. He's coming for your children. And it's only in the place of prayer that you can be sensitive to the tactics of the enemy and you know how to rebuke him. Adam should have rebuked this serpent. Adam should have interceded in this moment and stepped up to be the man in this moment. Because now they're going to lose everything because Adam did not step up. And I know some people are so upset about the way I teach about the Garden of Eden. But this is the revelation that God gave to me. That's what I saw when he took me back to Eden. That's what I saw. That's what he laid upon my heart to discuss. That that problem that has begun from the beginning of time, it still exists today. When you go to any church in the world, the population of women in the church are more than the men. How many men are really abiding in Christ? How many husbands are truly leading their families in the way of God? How many Daniels do we have in this generation? How many Josephs do we have in this generation? We have a whole lot more of Samsons and Solomons. They know the word of God. But their heart is so far away from God because they're given into lustful desires. This is the danger when your husband is spiritually weak. If you go back to King Ahasuerus, did you see what happened in that marriage? Esther grew up with the commandments of God. Esther was spiritually strong. So she knew how to subdue her king in the place of prayer. So when you know that your husband is like an Adam who is not spiritually strong, you know you're standing to lose a whole lot of the blessings the Lord has given to you. You're standing to lose your Eden. So you stay in the place of prayer. You have to be alert. And you are spiritually alert when you stay in the place of prayer. You know how the devil's coming after your family. You know your husband may not see it, but you see it. You know that mm, this is how he wants to come in and mess with us. So you rise in your spiritual authority like an Esther. You rise. And preserve your family. Preserve your purpose. Preserve your nation. Preserve the territory that God has called you to. Right now, this was the territory of Eden. The territory of the whole world. God had created Adam and Eve to flourish as the first parents of the earth. And in this moment, they lost everything because of spiritual weakness. You will be tempted. 
You will be. The devil knows what you desire. He will bring it to you. But when you are a praying person and you stay in the presence of God and you take everything to God, God will show you how to defeat the enemy. And he's already showing you that you, you, you have Jesus in you. You have the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You need to know your authority because if you're spiritually weak, your husband's spiritually weak, I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time you're going to have a huge crisis on your hands. Huge problem. Just by eating this fruit, just by disobeying God, Look at what happens here. They are cursed and they are sent out of the Garden of Eden. Then the eyes of both of them were open, verse 7. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fake leaves together and made themselves apron-like girdles. And then God comes looking for Adam. Why is God looking for Adam? Why isn't God looking for Eve? <laughs> Hallelujah! I've told you several times that God holds the husband ultimately responsible for the family. He's addressing Adam. He's addressing Adam. Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God is like, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And here comes the blame game. How many times has your husband done that to you? <laughs> the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Hello, Adam, were you not standing right next to her? Are you a baby that takes everything that the mother gives? The baby to eat? You're a grown man, Adam. This woman gave you the fruit, but you chose to eat it. You could have said no. In this moment, Adam should have been repentant towards God. But look at, look at his reaction. He's blaming the love of his life. That's what happens in marriage. You're so in love right now in your courtship. <laughs> Get married and see what marriage has for you. The blame game, it still happens today. It still happens today. You mess up. Your husband messes up. The two of you just want to blame each other instead of the two of you to humble yourselves and go before God and say, Father, we messed up. Help us to love each other again. We're sorry that we were angry at each other. Look at the blame game. Adam should have just repented in this moment, but no. Again, that's the problem with being spiritually weak. When you're spiritually weak, you lack humility. You should know when you have disobeyed God. You should know when you are out of order. Instead of hiding in your sin, you go to God and say, Father, I have messed up. Don't wait for God to come find you. You go to him. I don't waited for God to come find him. And then look at him blaming Eve, the love of his wife. What happened to the bone of his bone? The bone of your bone and the flesh of your flesh, you should cover her. Do you understand what I'm saying? You should protect your wife. You're not supposed to throw her out and blame her. Throw her under the bus as we say. You protect her in that moment. That father we messed up. I ate the fruit. Father. We disobeyed you. Because God is addressing Adam. He didn't even talk to Eve right now. He's talking to Adam. When it comes to your family. Your husband is ultimately responsible. That is the danger of being married to a man who is spiritually weak. You have to rise. And you have to rise the point of. Woo, you got to be strong like a Deborah or an Esther to preserve your family. Because a spiritually weak husband is clueless. He doesn't know anything spiritually. He does not know. He does not know that the devil has come to sit in your home, legs crossed, dealing with the two of you. But he doesn't know because he's spiritually weak. He's just focused on material things. He lost his job. He doesn't know that it's a spiritual attack. He's sick all the time. He doesn't know it's a spiritual attack. But you know. Because you are spiritually strong as a wife. But if you're not spiritually strong. And he's not spiritually strong. You will lose your Eden. It's only a matter of time. You will lose it. You will lose the promises and the blessings that the Lord has for you. You will lose it. Because you don't have the, spiritually, the spiritual maturity to preserve it. 
You need spiritual maturity to preserve the blessings of God over your life. God has to trust you. Look at what he took Joseph through. 13 years as a slave. God had to take Joseph through so many things to trust him with the position he was taking Joseph to. God has to trust you. God trusted Abraham. But when you're spiritually weak, you refuse to grow in Christ. You're just living after your flesh. God does not trust you with his blessings. He's going to send you out into the wilderness. That's what happens to Adam and Eve. So you keep reading the chapter. You see what happens. God curses them. I'm not going to go into that. If you want to see my detailed series on Back to Eden, go on YouTube. Listen to parts one to four. I really go into details. Now I'm just talking to you about Adam as the first husband. He was spiritually weak. And that's how Eden was lost. Someone has to be spiritually strong. And it is most better if it is the two of you. But in the marriages we have today, it's the women that are a lot more stronger. And I'm really praying for the men, for God to raise the men. It's unfortunate. Because where a godly man leads, a godly wife will follow. But when you don't have a godly husband leading you, you tend to make decisions. And if you're not a woman who's in the spirit, you can take Eve-like decisions and destroy the family. So you have to be in a place of prayer because you're guaranteed to lose your blessings if you're not spiritually alert. Some of you don't like to pray. You need to pray. It is crucial. The devil is coming after you in marriage. He came after Adam and Eve. You, he is coming after. You are not exempt from the tactics of the devil. You are not exempt from the wickedness and the hatred of the devil. As long as you say, I choose Christ, I am of Christ. Oh, the devil's coming after you. And he really loves to come after marriages. Because marriages are supposed to have continuity of godliness. Your godly offspring. That's what he's fighting. He doesn't want godliness to continue. He wants it to end. So when you get married, you say, oh, a godly woman got married to a godly man? Uh-uh, I'm coming after them. I mean, I'm going to distract them with so many problems and get them to hate each other. And then before you know, they'll get divorced or separated or something to distract from your ultimate purpose, which is to push forward the kingdom agenda. Marriage is a purpose to be fulfilled for God. Less about you and more about God. Yeah, God wants the two of you to be in love with each other. But he brought the two of you together to fulfill a purpose in his kingdom. Marriage is very purposeful. That's why you have to wait on God. Because the person he's bringing for you is to help you fulfill the purpose God created you for. Esther could not have saved the Jews. She, didn't, she wasn't married to the king of the land. Hello? There's no way she could have saved the Jews. She needed to be in a place of authority and God took her there. That was her husband, King Ahasuerus. So you can't just marry anyone. God has a king for you. And you need to stay in the place of prayer in order to recognize the king. And you need to recognize that it goes beyond the love you have for the king. The two of you need to have your eyes on God, submitted to God, loving God and say, Father, we are here to serve you. That's the way the two of you must approach marriage. It's not just about you. No. Adam and Eve had a job to do. To replenish the earth. Not just stay in the garden of Eden. Just frolicking and doing whatever they wanted to do. They were created purposefully. To birth creation. And the devil came. So your marriage has a great purpose attached to it. But the devil's coming for you to fight that purpose. Be prepared. Be prepared. All right, so in verse, I'm going to wrap this up now. I'm going into chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to know how to distinguish between good and evil and blessing and calamity. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So God drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every way to keep and guard the way to the tree of life. So again, in sending them out of Eden, God is addressing the man. The husband is ultimately responsible for the family. So when you're married to a man who is not godly, and does not fear God, and does not follow the ways of God, you're in deep trouble, woman. You're in deep trouble. You need to keep praying for the salvation of that man. 
You need to keep praying or you just hand everything over to God. Because some of you have gotten married without asking God from the beginning. And once you hand over your marriage to God, I've told you the three things that God can do to release you from that marriage. We go into Abigail and Abel. Your spouse may end up dying. Number two, your husband can divorce you. First Corinthians 7.15. Or number three, your husband can come into the kingdom of God. So again, when you're a woman in the place of praying, you draw near to God, you take your issue to God, and God will hear you and answer you. But look at how God addressed Adam from the beginning to the end. Adam was ultimately responsible. Yeah, Eve gave him the fruit to eat, and God cursed Eve, but God cursed Adam and addressed Adam every step of the way. So it is very important to marry a godly man. It is very important for our husbands to stay in a place of godliness because God holds them accountable. Accountable. So my prayer for you, God girl, is I hope you're not married to an Adam. But if you're married to an Adam, you should know what to do because we've looked at different kinds of husbands. We're on part eight now. You should know how to navigate the terrain of your marriage. Again, it's all about staying in the place of prayer. And God, with his infinite wisdom, will help you, daughter of God. He will help you. He will help you. And if you're a man, listen to this message. You have a wife who is spiritually weak. Please stay in the place of prayer and God will deliver you. In his own way. All right? God loves you and I love you. This is Pastor Bella, Alex Nosage, Ultimate God Girl. God bless you.